It is with great pride that Learnit is the digital partner of this event organized by Indian College of Anesthesiologists. And the topic of today's session is Anesthesia for Structural Heart Disease Interventions. So let's begin today's session for which I would like to invite Dr. Murlidhar, sir. Over to you, sir. Kindly proceed with your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Rupsa, for that invitation. And uh, I am greatly delighted to invite you for this uh, seminar, this uh, sort of webinar which is entitled as um, Structural Heart Disease and what is the role of anesthesiologists in the interventions of these um, special types of cases with, which we deal with in most of the cardiac centers in India. I would like to thank the ICA, that is the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, for this excellent opportunity given to us and um, uh, in in the path to uh, realizing the uh, ultimate knowledge. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank the leadership of ICA for this uh, facility, which has been going on un uninterruptedly for the last three and up to four years now. Every Wednesday, 79 is the webinar time and everyone uh, is um, anxiously or eagerly, not anxiously, eagerly, awaiting this webinar. Today, we, our topic is structural heart disease. As you know, cardiovascular disease is very rampant. In fact, every third person is uh, expected to have some sort of cardiovascular disease, be it hypertension, ischemic heart disease, or some other form of cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's not worth it to note that uh, even uh, cerebrovascular disease and cerebrovascular dis uh, disorders are classified as cardiovascular disease in the WHO criteria. With that brief introduction, I would uh, like to invite Dr. Ganapati Arumuga and Dr. Kaushik Jyotinath. Both of them are accomplished cardiac anesthesiologists practicing in uh, Chennai and Coimbatore respectively. I'm really indebted to them. And we also have Dr. Anuradha Ghi who works with us. Uh, she's my colleague. Thank you, Dr. Anuradha for joining and Dr. Ganapati and Kaushik. I may take the liberty of addressing you by your first name, Dr. Ganapati Kaushik Kananarurada. Um, thank you for joining us. We have uh, uh, six short talks, aortic valve, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve, and paravalve leaks, followed by left atrial appendage closure. Each one will uh, be a brief presentation of the techniques used and what is the Anesthetic technique chosen will be mentioned in a very brief, uh, succinct manner. And with that, I would like to request Dr. Ganapati to take over and uh, um, conduct the meeting. Thank you so much for joining. Stay till the end. Questions will be at the end of the session. If you have any questions to answer, uh, to ask, please put it in the chat box. Any questions or comments are welcome. We'll try to address all the questions at the end of the, the, the six uh, topics highlighted in the brochure. Thank you so much once again and look forward to a useful discussion at the end of the webinar. Dr. Ganapati Armugam, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, very good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Ganapati from Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. I'm a senior consultant. And uh, in our institute, we do a lot of structural heart interventions like uh, TAVI, mitra clip, tricuspid implantation, uh, all these things. Uh, we started doing uh, TAVIs from 2014-15 uh, uh, and uh, we would have uh, done more than 350 cases so far. And um, uh, uh, it is a wonderful procedure. It is a wonderful procedure. And uh, what... Uh, one has to undergo uh, open heart surgery to replace the aortic valve. Uh, this is done as a percutaneous technique and uh, second day or third day patient will be discharged home. And uh, that is wonderful uh, for the uh, inoperable patients. And uh, without wasting uh, much time, uh, we can uh, go ahead with the first talk. Transcatheter aortic valve implantation, the TAVI, uh, uh, with the uh, introduction and anesthetic implication by Dr. Aluri Sojanya. Uh, I invite uh, the speaker to take over. Good evening, sir. Can you share the screen? 
Yes. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yes, sir. So, uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like uh, to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to deliver a talk on uh, this webinar. So today's topic of discussion would be perioperative anesthetic management of transcatheter aortic valve implantation or transcatheter aortic valve replacement, TAVI or TEVA. patients these days. So the indications for TAVI continue to broaden as random days. So the main advantages of TAVI when Sujanya, your voice is breaking. Is it same with everyone? Compared to the surgical The audio is not poor. Audio is not Good. So, Janiya, can you hear me? Teacher would be the avoidance of stenotomy. Hold on, hold on, uh, Sojanya. I'll try again, sir. Yeah, uh, I... I'm able to hear you, sir. Am I audible, sir? Now, now I'm audible, uh, but in between your voice is uh, breaking. Okay, sir. Uh, shall I continue, sir? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can start from the first slide. Okay. Perioperative anesthetic management of transcatheter aortic valve implantation or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Although surgery remains the established choice for most of the patients with severe aortic stenosis, TAVI may, may be more suitable for an increasing proportion of the patients nowadays. The indications for TAVI continue to broaden as randomized evidence for the patients with, with different surgical risk profiles are emerging. What are the main advantages of TAVI when compared to surgical procedures? These are avoidance of stenotomy, avoidance of exposure to cardiopulmonary bypass and its complications, and expected recovery from the post procedure so what uh, which group of patients would be selected more uh, towards the group of transcatheter aortic valve replacement when compared to surgical avr patients with severe comorbidities of age more than 75 years with previous cardiac surgeries with favorable vascular access porcelain iota where uh, cannulation and uh, uh, touching the iota would be harmful, intact coronary artery bypass grafts, and any chest wall deformities like kypho severe kyphoscoliosis with respiratory uh, deformities. Along with this, risk, strat risk stratification also plays an important role in categorizing the patients whether to go for a TAVI or a SAVER. Most of the randomized control trials uh, trials stratify the risk according to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Risk Score and Euroscore 2. So the intervals are defined by the risk of death at 30 days after the surgery. Low risk is less than or equal to 8%. Moderate to high risk is more than or equal to 8%. And the evidence of, for the use of TAVI first emerged in the group who were at high risk for surgery to the placement of aortic transcatheter wall partner A and B trials. The only absolute contraindication to TAVI is only the active endocarditis. Rest of all are relative contraindications which are based on patient-related and technical factors such as severe comorbidities or frailty with a, with a life expectancy of less than one year, short distance between annulus and coronary ostium, and, and if there is any mobile thrombus in the ascending iota. The other relative contraindications would be LVEF below 20%, Severe vascular disease precluding safe pl placement of the introducer sheets, cerebrovascular event within six months, and any need for emergency surgery. 
so this article which is published in 2022 uh, and and emphasizes on advancements in transcatheter aortic valve implantation in patient selection and preparation so we categorize the patient selection according to the pressure gradient according to the flow across the stenosed valve in terms of stroke volume index and according to the cal calcium score by ct assessment this is the regular cath lab uh, arrangement uh, where we have undertaken the tavi procedures this we call it as hybrid operating room where we can see the patient surgical table with a cm machine and an uh, echo machine to guide the interventional procedures this is the preparation table the perfusion pump which plays a main role in uh, emergency situations so what are the various approaches for tavi trans femoral trans subclavian trans aortic trans axillary and trans apical trans apical is a minimally invasive access through which the cardiac apex and direct uh, through the through which the cardiac apex is accessed and uh, the valve can be directly placed antigradely so the most common approach is through ultrasound guided puncture of the femoral artery and retrograde implantation of the device which we can see through the yellow line so this is the trans femoral approach first we usually access the femoral uh, vessels to the ultrasound guidance and then we have retrogradely place the aortic valve in a retrograde fashion the other approach which is shown by the green arrow is the subclavian approach where we have access the subclavian artery we can approach directly the aorta also which we call as trans aortic uh, approach trans axillary approach which we have approached the axillary artery all these above uh, approaches are retrograde approaches whereas trans apical approach which only which only can be accessed through mini sternot mini sternotomy or thoracotomy uh, is the antigrade approach among all the approaches so imaging plays an important role in preoperative assessment of tavi patients gated C cardiac ct has become the standard of care for patients undergoing tavi for aortic valve uh, aortic root and vascular access assessments so it enables important anatomical and technical factors to be considered and detailed evaluation of iliofemoral anatomy and suitability for the access route for tavi with a preference for transfemoral approach and assessment of anatomical and technical aspects of alternative access routes like subclavian axillary transcarotid direct aortic and transapical can also be assessed with gated cardiac ct images types of valves used in tavi are balloon expanded valves which include sapien xt sapien 3 advanced life, life sciences and self expanding devices which include core valve which which we usually use these days the other recently advancing valve uh, which is self expanding device is portico and accurate so this image shows the balloon expanded valve that is constructed with a radio opaque cobalt chromium frame and a triliflet bovine pericardial tissue with a polytetraphylate fabric skirt this image shows the self expanding valve which is constructed over a nitinol frame with a porcine pericardial tissue valve first we need to access the vascular site for the insertion of the introducer sheaths so uh, so the sheath insertion that may range from 14 french to 20 french systems are based on type and size of the valves which which we have decided based on the preoperative ct assessment so the most common approach is percutaneous transfemoral but this may be unfavorable for many of the patients with hostile perif peripheral vascular disease or aortic anatomies like porcelain aorta and any secondary 6 french access can also be required to guide the valve deployment and after achieving the access with the sheets it requires anticoagulation with a preferable act of around 250 to 300 so this is the vascular access uh, here the right femoral artery is accessed for the device deployment the left femoral artery and vein are accessed to provide the hemodynamic monitoring transvenous spacing contrast administration and any preparation for the emergency cardiopulmonary bypass so after locating the femoral access through the ultrasound the contrast angiography is performed to delineate the bifurcation and exact location of the puncture. So this is the insertion of the temporary transvenous spacing. This is a balloon tip temporary transvenous spacing which is guided into the RV under fluoroscopic guidance. This is a prerequisite for any balloon aortic valvuloplasty for a pre-dilatation. And this is a prerequisite for balloon expanded valve like Edwards. In the event of prolonged PR interval and, and any altered QRS morphology post deployment of the TAVI valve, 
this TPI wires can be secured until the any permanent pacemaker is planned. In this situation, preferably the IJV approach facilitates the patient to sit up to sit in upright position even with TPI in situ. In this loop, we can see uh, the balloon tip uh, TPI is directed into the RVFX under fluoroscopic guidance. This is inserted either this can be inserted either through the IJV approach or femoral axis. And after inserting the TPI, we can uh, uh, give a root injection with a fluoroscopy uh, in order to assess the coronaries and their takeoff and their height from the aortic annulus. So the distance from the coronary ostium to the aortic valve annulus is called as the osteal height, which, uh, which should be appropriately more than or equal to 12 to 13 mm for an appropriate uh, TAVI wall to be deployed. So this, this image shows the balloon aortic valvuloplasty, which is done as a, as a prerequisite for a pre-dilatation. This is a case of severely calcific and stenosed native aortic wall, where a pre-dilatation is planned with a balloon across the wall, which facilitates easier transcatheter delivery. It usually requires the demand for rapid ventricular pacing during the phase of balloon inflation. So the rapid ventricular uh, pacing can be, achieved, can be achieved with the TPI valve, which we have placed... Uh, as shown in the previous slides. So usually the rapid ventricular pacing can be carried out uh, for a period of five to 10 seconds where the systolic blood pressure or the mean, or the mean blood pressure uh, is brought down to about 40 to 50 mm Hg. And uh, this is usually done to stabilize or to pre-dilate with a balloon. So here, uh, this image shows the TAVI valve which is crimped and mounted over a catheter so that we can pass this crimped wall which is mounted over the catheter to the femoral axis into the LV. So this loop shows the TAVI wall which is crossing the native aortic wall which is stenosed. This is the self-inflating wall during the deployment. Here we can see the self-inflating wall usually does not require any rapid ventricular pacing during deployment. That is only the balloon expandable wall that is adverse which use the rapid ventricular pacing. This wall consists of the self-expanding nitinol frame, which you can see in the loop. This is self-expanding without any use of rapid ventricular pacing. So after partially, infla after partially inflated uh, the core wall, we have to check angiography to visualize the coronaries and appropriate placement of the wall. So this is the contrast angiography, which is performed at the aortic root post deployment. This is to assess any paravalvular leaks, to assess any aortic valve regurgitation and to look for any catheter related complications like dissection of diotic root. In this loop we can see the completely inflated tower valve. This is the post deployment uh, lateral rotation of the CM machine to check the complete inflation or deployment of the TAVI valve. After the complete deployment of the TAVI valve and after uh, the catheter is withdrawn from the LV, we have to check the vascular integrity after the procedure. Uh, this, this loop shows the sheath contrast fluoroscopy, which, uh, which is given by contrast injected over the sheath. And this, uh, the second loop shows the digital subtraction and angiography, which emphasizes the integrity of the particular vessel of interest. So the choice of anesthesia would be either infiltration of local anesthesia with or without conscious sedation or, or a general anesthesia. So when a general anesthesia is required, the, all the general principles of anesthetizing a patient with severe AS should apply, like tracheal intubation with neuromuscular blockade, maintaining a low or normal heart rate, sinus rhythm, adequate intravascular volume, high or normal systemic vascular resistance, and new onset of atrial fibrillation is very poorly tolerated in these subset of patients, so adequate rate control is required. But infiltration of local anesthesia with monitored anesthesia care, the major advantage is direct communication with the patient to assess the neurology, rapid recovery, and lesser hospital stay. The vascular complications are the most common which we come across during TAVI. Here we can see the dissection with leakage of the fluoroscope, with leakage of the contrast under fluoroscopy. And the second picture shows the dissection with a thrombus sitting. The second most common uh, complication we come across is conduction abnormalities. This is due to direct damage of the AV, AV node or his bundle. The left bundle branch block is the most common abnormality and in the presence of significant baseline conduction disturbances very high risk of AV, AV block 
permanent pacemaker system should be implanted implanted before TAVI. The other complication is coronary artery obstruction, incidence of less than 1% with extremely poor outcomes. This is due to displacement of native, native calcified valve leaflet over the coronary ostia. The incidence of stroke continues to decrease with rates now 2 to 5% when compared to 8%, which, uh, which was previously observed. The use of minimalistic TRAVI approach with local anesthesia in awake patients allows for intraoperative and immediate postoperative neurological assessment. The etiology may be multifactorial, could be related to embolic etheroma, valvular calcific material, thromboembolism, and significant hypotension. Thank you. Yeah, it's a uh, nice talk, uh, Sojanya. And uh, uh, regarding this uh, STS scoring, uh, uh, it is a uh, score of 4 and less is low risk. 4 to 8 is intermediate risk and uh, above 8 is uh, high risk. So generally, initially, we started uh, doing TAVI only for high risk patients. With the improve in the technology, now we are doing for intermediate risk and low risk also. And uh, that is one comment. And uh, uh, the discussion questions will be at the end. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, now I'll uh, ask Dr. Koshik to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Arvogam, sir. And uh, Saujanya, it was a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, before we go on, uh, I'm reminded of uh, one of uh, Louis Armstrong's uh, famous quote. One small step for mankind, uh, whereas it was a giant step for mankind. So to deal with one more uh, giant leap in this field of interventional cardiology, I would like to call upon Dr. Elizabeth Preeti to talk about uh, transcutaneous mitral valve procedures. Dr. Elizabeth? Just come and just say hi. Yes, sir. You can start your uh, slides here. Good evening, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about transcatheter mitral valve procedures. Um, mitral valve pathology can be complex, and it may, it may involve both the valve leaflets and the annulus. Uh, transcatheter therapies have been developed to correct mitral regurgitation in a variety of ways. Transcatheter H2H repair is the most successful of the transcatheter mitral valve procedures, and it is an alternative to surgical mitral valve intervention in selected patients. Um, Another option is transcatheter mitral valve repair or replacement. Uh, under transcatheter mitral valve edge to edge repair, there are two devices currently available. That is Mitra Clip by Abbott and Pascal Repair System by Edwards Life Sciences. Both these devices use a leaflet repair method that opposes the anterior and posterior leaflets at the site of the regurgitant jet, improving coaptation while creating a double orifice valve. Um, this shows the the image on the left shows the mitra clip system, and the image on the right shows the Pascal uh, system. Uh, this show this image shows the uh, double orifice mitral valve after application of the clip. Indications for um, uh, transcatheter H2H repair are uh, percutaneous uh, for percutaneous reduction of significant symptomatic mitral regurgitation that is more than three plus due to degenerative etiology in patients who are high risk for mitral valve surgery. 
uh, contraindications include uh, patients who cannot tolerate procedural anticoagulations anticoagulation patients who cannot tolerate post procedure antiplatelet regimens uh, if there is an evidence of intracardiac uh infra inferior vena cava or femoral venous thrombus and patients with active endocarditis relative contraindications include patients with a mitral valve area less than 4 cm square and unfavorable mitral valve anatomy including leaflet calcium deposition uh perioperative management uh, before proceeding with transcatheter transcatheter h2h repair a complete history and physical examination must be performed to evaluate the suitability for cardiac surgery or uh, repair Uh, an anatomic assessment of the mitral valve is necessary to to determine whether uh, transcatheter h2h repair is feasible a uh, pre procedural trans thoracic echocardiography can determine the severity of mitral regurgitation and identify concomitant valvular disease uh, treatment of severe aortic stenosis with tavi should be first considered as this may cons- contribute to both symptoms and severity of mitral regurgitation a uh, preoperative 3d transesophageal echocardiography should be performed for a more detailed understanding of valve pathology uh, favorable anatomy for degenerative mitral regurgitation consists of a2p2 prolapse or flail with a gap of less than 10 mm uh, unfavorable valvular features include multiple jets the presence of clefts near the leaflet prolapse uh, leaflet restriction previous annuloplasty ring or severe mitral annular calcification other unfavorable anatomic findings include a uh, thickened interatrial septum hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve uh, uh these are the echocardiographic features determining the suitability for transcatheter h2h repair a uh, favorable anatomy includes a central uh, uh, pathology located to the central portion a2p2 prolapse normal leaflet motion leaflet length more than 10 mm uh, central mr jet a uh, single M- single jet mitral valve area more than 5 cm square with a gradient of less than 3 mm hg a difficult anatomy includes multiple jets multiple prolapse of failed segments uh, cleft near the leaflet grasp restricted leaflet motion uh, severe mitral a- valve annular cancer- calcification uh, the steps in uh, involved in mitral mitral clip are uh, these are uh, guided by uh, transesophageal echo and fluoroscopy uh, tran- first is the transeptal axis to the left atrium uh, guided by echocardiography uh, insertion of a steerable guide catheter and a clip delivery system into the left atrium uh, then the clip is positioned in the left atrium and the clip is advanced to the left ventricle and the leaflets are grasped and it is assessed for uh, residual mr and the clip is deployed and later on the uh, catheter delivery system and the steerable guide catheter are uh, withdrawn <clears throat> this image shows the mitral clip in a closed position when the uh, and when the clip is opened and uh, prior to release and the shows how the leaflets are grasped and how the clip is closed and uh, the clip is deployed um this image the first image shows the uh, mitral regurgitation before the procedure the second image shows the uh, uh, septal puncture tr- from the interatrial septum uh, then the lower image shows the reduction in the mitral regurgitation after the clip has been deployed anesthetic management for patients undergoing ter routinely involves general anesthesia with an endotracheal tube to facilitate comprehensive te examination um g uh, the use of general anesthesia may underestimate the mitral regurgitation uh, usually invasive arterial monitoring is used um, for patients with ni nyha class 3 or above with heart failure they might need pre op optimization with the use of inotropes and vasopressors the anesthesiologist should be prepared for potential complications including intracardiac perforation cardiac arrhythmias air embolism via the delivery catheter um significant reduction of mr will acutely increase lv afterload Uh, peripheral venous injury is uh, typically easier to manage in venous structures compared to arterial injury um, fluid restriction is preferred in patients with decompensated heart failure uh, in uneventful procedures patient can be extubated at the end of the procedure uh, the team members should be prepared for procedural complications which may include uh, alternative approaches including a sternotomy cardiopulmonary bypass or abortion of the procedure Uh, complications can be device related and procedure related a uh, device related includes structural failure that is when a single leaflet uh, 
device the, the device has been attached to a single leaflet uh, device embolization leaflet injury uh, functional impairment includes uh, residual mr more than grade 2 uh, and transmetal gradient more than 5 mm uh, procedure related complications include uh, access site vascular complications which includes bleeding perforation rupture or dissection uh, cardiac structural damage which includes pericardial effusion tamponade uh, hemodynamic hemodynamically significant interatrial septal defect uh, bleeding and thromboembolic complications uh, the next procedure is transcatheter mitral valve repair or replacement uh, there are various uh, devices which can be used for this uh, depending on the native primary and secondary mitral regurgitation uh, if it's just a leaflet repair mitral clip or pascal system is used for caudal repair neocord is used for annuloplasty repair uh, mitral align is used and uh, for transcatheter mitral valve replacement edwards uh, devices are used uh, this shows the various uh, transcatheter mitral valve repair and replacement devices uh, the transcatheter mitral valve uh, repair procedure includes uh, transeptal access and then the uh, delivery catheter is positioned across the mitral valve annulus using fluoroscopy and te guidance the valve delivery begins by uh, drawing back the valve valve cover to expose the ventricular disc. Uh, the valve seating is confirmed via echo. Valve de delivery is completed by exposing and then releasing the atrial disc, at which time the valve is fully functional. Um, in general, the transcatheter annuloplasty ring devices are used for secondary MR, while caudal replacement devices are used for degenerative MR. Anesthetic management for TMVR is similar to TER, uh, defibrillator paddles should be used in anticipation of iatrogenic arrhythmia from intracardiac wire placement. Standard induction and maintenance of anesthesia should be dependent on individual patient comorbidities. In addition to the risk previously mentioned in DER, the anesthesiologist should be prepared for complications that are device-specific complications, which are coronary sinus rupture, anchor disengagement and coronary injury, uh, LV rupture and conduction disturbances, and device embolization. After uncomplicated implantation, most patients can be uh, immediately extubated and monitored postoperatively. Um, distribution of mitral annular calcification. <clears throat> the degree and distribution of mitral annular calcification is an important consideration as non-severe, particularly non-circumferential mitral annular calcification may result in poor device sealing leading to paravalvular leak or device embolization or migration. Uh, and the left ventricular outflow tract also needs to be assessed. The, lift, the risk of left ventricular out, outflow tract obstruction is influenced by several factors, including iotomitral angle, the size and shape of the left ventricle, septal hypertrophy, anterior mitral valve leaflet size, and process choice and positioning. Uh, TMVR success is dependent on <coughs> multimodality imaging. Wherein echocardiography, <coughs> wherein echocardiography is pivotal in pre-procedural, intra-procedural, and post-procedural Dr. Preeti, we lost a couple of your slides from uh, your echocardiography and planning. Are you able to hear us? Okay, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Maybe you could redo the last, the last uh, couple of yes, slides. Sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Um, so for the pre-procedure echocardiography, uh, transthoracic echo and transesophageal echo both are used uh, to, dis to assess the mitral valve anatomy and pathology. A successful procedure requires careful evaluation of the mitral apparatus, presence and a distribution of calcification, relationship to the left ventricular outflow tract, left ventricle, left atrium, atrial septal and basal ventricular septal anatomy, right 
<clears throat> right ventricular size and function, pulmonary artery pressure, and other valve lesions of clinical significance. Um, generally, we uh, for the accurate valve deployment, uh, we usually use a, a transesophageal echocardiography guide, uh, guidance with uh, fluoroscopy guidance. A multiplanar reconstruction has emerged as a promising adjunctive or a, a, as a promising adjunctive. During deployment, several aspects are assessed. That is the valve anchoring, paravalvular seal, valve function, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, right and left ventricular function, potential complications such as uh, pericardial abnormalities Dr. Preeti? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, again, I think we lost you on the last slide, but I think uh, we just carry on with this. It was a very nice and uh, elaborate uh, presentation. Uh, request Dr. Anuradha to uh, please introduce the next speaker and carry on. Hello. Uh, yes, please carry yeah. on. We yeah. can hear you. Good. Yeah. Good but evening, everyone. Your video. Please switch on your video when you're speaking. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, now, Dr. Akshita is going to present. Hello. Yeah, as per the uh, list, good evening, Satish. everyone. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Satish is going to present on uh, uh, going to brief us on the percutaneous tri tricuspid valve uh, interventions. Good evening. Good evening to everyone. Today my topic is transcripted tricuspid valve repair. Coming to the basic anatomy of the tricuspid valve, the tricuspid valve consists of valve leaflets, cordate tendineae, papillary muscles, and annular ring and RV myocardium. The tricuspid valve is a tri leaflet with anterior septal and posterior leaflets of unequal size. The anterior papillary muscle is the largest and originates from the moderator brand, while the cordate tendineae connect the papillary muscles to the tricuspid leaflets. The tricuspid valve annulus is larger and located in a Slightly more apical portion than the mitral valve annulus. This is the in the image. This is the mitral valve and this is a tricuspid valve. Showing all the three leaflets. Uh, in transesophageal echocardiography, it is a mid esophageal four chamber view. In this, we can view septal leaflet with Anti either anterior or posterior leaflet and mid esophageal RV inflow outflow view. 
in this we can view posterior mitral leaflet with either anterior posterior uh, tri, uh, tricuspid leaflet with either anterior or septal leaflet and this gives the mid esophageal modified bicaval view in this we can view the anterior tricuspid leaflet and posterior tricuspid leaflet coming to the tricuspid regurgitation it is it has been divided into primary and secondary in the primary that is the abnormalities will be seen in the leaflets the absence of anomaly tricuspid valve tattering dysplasia double orifice myxomatous degeneration endocarditis carcinoid and rheumatic heart disease all comes under this category and coming to the secondary the in this the leaflets are normal but the alter aspects of right heart can be seen the left sided heart disease rv dysfunction primary pulmonary arterial hypertension idiopathic tattering or stenting of leaflets displacement of papillary muscles and annular dilatation can be seen and coming to the grading of mitral regurgitation as usual it is graded as mild moderate severe the severe tricuspid regurgitation shows the jet area of more than 10 cm square with flow with large flow convergence and dense and triangular jet density of color and jet area more than 7 cm square with vena contracta with more than 7.7 cm and fissa more than 0.9 cm with s reversal seen in the hepatic vein flow and e wave dominance in the tricuspid inflow with eroa 0.4 cm square and regurgitant volume more than 45 ml coming to the the types of devices it has been the variety of devices it has been <coughs> the leaflet devices are forma triclip pascal and mistral the annuloplasty devices are tri align cardio band millipede fasta cardiac implants mia polycor anchor the heterotopic implants are trinity sapien tricentro triqual and the orthotopic or navigate trisol lux tricat intrepid evacue and vidine and these are the images the leaflet directed devices the leaflet directed devices are forma triclip pascal and mistral ring annuloplasty as we are showing trialine cardio band millipede fasta cardiac implants and heterotopic uh, tri trinity sapien tricentro and triqual known as cable devices and orthotopic or navigate trisol lux tricat intrepid and <clears throat> the transcatheter tricuspid valve therapy it has been divided as tricuspid valve repair and tricuspid valve replacement in this the coaptation devices or trialine pascal triclip pistral sorry and annuloplasty or cardio band millipede pasta and polycar anchors the valve replacement devices are navigate trisol lux trikers and how we need to select the patient and the device selection whenever the patient come with the symptomatic severe functional tricuspid regurgitation first of all we need to look for significant comorbidities like for end stage liver disease end stage renal disease severe lung disease fixed severe portal hypertension neurologic dysfunction and malignancy then uh, ruling out those things we need to we need to make sure of i or progressive surgical risk if there is no surgical risk means they can proceed with the surgical inter intervention but the if there is the, the annuloplasty devices can be used for annular dilatation with minimal leaflet tattering if there is a surgical intervention the annuloplasty devices can be used for annular dilatation with minimal leaflet tattering the edge to edge device combined technique that is annuloplasty plus edge to edge technique can be do can be the, done for annular dilatation with mild moderate leaflet tattering and coaptation gap less than 7 to 10 mm the coaptation device forma that is the orthotopic and heterotopic valve implantation can be done for 
advanced right ventricular remodeling with severe leaflet tethering and wide coaptation gap. And coming to the triclip transcatheter tricuspid valve. Here, it features a delivery system specifically designed for use within the right atrium. And this gives the video first. And once the catheter has been inserted, and once the and this gives the video for the tri clip. First, a steerable guide catheter insertion has been done. Then, the my tri clip has been delivered and proceeding into the tricuspid uh, the uh, abnormal leaflet the triclip positioning above the septal anterior line of coaptation and advancing the triclip into the ventricle And now, this shows the image of deploying, positioning the tri clip into the and grasping and then closing the tri clip and at last deploying the tri clip leaflet. And next, I am showing the trial line, which is here. The video showing the trial line valve, tricuspid valve prepared. The guide wire has been inserted through the IJV. And now, the catheter has been inserted and future future material has been in a, inserted and now we are making tightening the anterior tricuspid leaflet and then now posterior leaflet has been tied and as we tighten the both the thing, the tricuspid annulus getting reduced. And coming to the Pascal, the Pascal repair system, it has also been used for both mitral and tricuspid valves. It includes a central spacer with adjacent paddles and clasp. This is the Pascal. And this is the uh, the thing that is used to deploy the Pascal system. It contains the guide seat, steerable seat, and implant seat. 
Next, coming to the tricuspid annular plastic devices. The cardio band tricuspid valve reconstruction system, it is a catheter delivered annular reduction system that mimics a surgical annular plastic. It is advanced into the right atrium via femoral vein and anchored onto the atrial site of the tricuspid annulus. The implant is then clinched to reduce septolateral diameter of annulus, improving coaptation and decreasing the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. Next, coming the trick valve. So in the delivery of the trick valve, the trick valve is two self-expanding percutaneous art valves customized to provide 10 to 20 percentage of oversizing of the SVC and IVC. IVC valve protrude into the right atrium preventing backflow and the SVC is funnel shaped with skirt covering the entire base of the valve. Next, coming the tricento device. It is composed of a bicavely stent with lateral bicuspid valve element made of thin pork and pericardium leaflets. It requires on, only a low closing process. The aim of this device is to prevent the systolic backflow in both the IVC and the SVC. Cavel Valve implantation. It has been used to treat the heart failure symptoms with severe tricuspid regurgitation. The regurgitation blood jets into the cavel veins in severe chronic TR. This can be prevented with the use of heterotopic transcatheter devices. This, give, this gives the image of the tricentro device position. And next, coming the orthotopic transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. Navigate it is a temperature shape memory nitinol wrapped stent in flow. The height profile is 21 millimeter truncated cone configuration with a diffuser effect. It is and next comes the lux valve. It is a self-expanding bovine pericardial tissue valve mounted on a nitinol stent frame. Translateral approach through a minimally invasive thoracotomy. It's a self-adaptive stirred to minimize paravalvular regurgitation. Annular devices require identification of tricuspid annulus, measurement of tricuspid valve perimeter and depth of annular tissue from leaflet end point to right coronary artery. For, re for leaflet repair devices, adequate visibility of tricuspid valve leaflet with TE needs to be confirmed prior to patient selection. TTVA is performed with fluoroscopic and transesophageal echocardiography guidance. Femoral vein is used as the other site for system delivery into the right atrium. For some cases, we will use the IJV approach. During cardio band device, for device implantation, TE guidance is used to determine the appropriate amount of annular reduction. Coronary wire is placed in the right coronary artery and can be used as a fluoroscopic marker for tricuspid valve annulus. Patients undergoing TTVA are typically at eye surgical risk, risk and have severe functional tricuspid regurgitation in setting of impaired RV function. Coronary angiography is performed after device implantation to confirm the right coronary artery patency. The procedure is done with the endotracheal tube intubation general anesthesia with invasive blood pressure monitoring before we need to uh, before taking in the patient we need to take the cv um, we need to take the proper history of the patient and after shifting in we need to put the iv venous uh, ivss and with the standard uh, and a standard induction and maintenance track we can go for intubation 
and can be maintained with the general and IV anesthetics. The once after the procedure over, the patient can be extubated on the table. Coming to the complications of the procedure, or as usual for other valve repairs, there is a leaflet injury, leaflet rupture, uh, uh, leaflet rupture and bleeding, and uh, chances of uh, arrhythmias are there. Thanking you. Thank you, Satish. It was a wonderful presentation. And you have explained it very beautifully with the help of videos. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Anuradha, for that um, uh, moderation. I would like to now invite Karishma. Uh, Karishma will be telling us. Can you please unshare your screen, uh, Satish? Yes, sir. Done, Karishma sir. to share the screen. Karishma, please come, sir. Karishma will be telling us about the pulmonary valve uh, procedures, which can be done in hybrid or catheterization labs. A very important aspect of care of patients, especially when the tetralogy of pharaohs has been corrected in the childhood and uh, the child grows into adulthood, the pulmonary regurgitation may remain and may become a significant problem which needs to be addressed. So we will see how Karishma is going to tell us what she's going to tell us regarding the pulmonary valve implantation using percutaneous or trans catheter techniques. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll be talking about transcatheter pulmonary wall replacement. Transcatheter pulmonary wall replacement is a non-surgical alternative for pulmonary wall re replacement in adult and teen patients with the recurrent or native right ventricular outflow tract dysfunction after surgical repair of congenital heart diseases. It was first described in the early 2000s by Bonhoeffer which led to the development of the melody wall by Medtronic. What is right ventricular outflow tract dysfunction? Right ventricular outflow tract dysfunction is a sequelae of surgically repaired congenital heart diseases that involve the right ventricular outflow tract. It occurs most commonly due to pulmonary regurgitation, but can also be due to pulmonary stenosis at the level of the anastomosis or wall, ki wall kinking, intimal proliferation, calcification or sternal compression. Tetralogy of fallow is the most common congenital heart disease with right ventricle uh, outflow tract dis, uh, dysfunction or obstruction, which is uh, surgically corrected by three methods. One is the transannular patch. Second is the right ventricle to the uh, pulmonary artery conduit. And the third is bioprosthetic walls. The problem with these three methods is that there is usually deep can also inevitably fail with time. This leads to pulmonary regurgitation, pulmonary stenosis, or- These slides have not go, have gone. Can you sort it out? Uh, just a minute, sir. Share the screen again. Yes, sir. Is it visible now, sir, the slides? Yeah, visible now. 
Yeah, should I start from the first slide again? Hello? Yeah, you can go from here. Okay, sir. Okay, so I'll begin again. Sorry for that. Uh, so basically, uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement, it is a non-surgical alternative for pulmonary valve replacement in adult and teen patients with the recurrent or native right ventricular outflow tract dysfunction, which usually occurs after surgical repair of any congenital heart disease. It was first described in the early 2000 by Bonnefer, which led to the, eventually led to the development of melody wall by Medtronic. What is a uh, right ventricular outflow tract dysfunction? It is actually a sequelae of surgically repaired uh, congenital heart diseases that involve the RVOT. It occurs most commonly due to pulmonary regurgitation, but can also be due to pulmonary stenosis at the site of the anastomosis or the bioprosthetic wall, or due to kinking, intimal proliferation, calcification, or sternal compression. Tetralogy of fallow is the most common congenital heart disease with presence with right ventricular outflow tract obstruction which is surgically corrected by three methods. One is a transannular patch, which is shown over here. The second is the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery stenosis. And the third is placement of a bioprosthetic wall. The problem with, the, with, with these procedures is that there is eventually degeneration of the biological material of the bioprosthesis and the wall conduit. The RV to PA conduits also inevitably fail with time which leads to pulmonary regurgitation or uh, pulmonary stenosis or at times both. This leads to pressure and volume loading on the right ventricle and right ventricle, uh, right ventricle outflow tract dysfunction, which presents as right ventricle dilatation, right ventricle failure and LV failure, fatal arrhythmias and even sudden death. So although, sir, uh, sir, although surgical replacement of the uh, uh, Pulmonary wall is indicated. Transcatheter uh, is the is is preferred in these patients. So different societies have different guidelines for uh, transcatheter pulmonary wall replacement. But in general, uh, transcatheter pulmonary wall replacement is indicated in patients with moderate symptomatic patients with moderate or severe pulmonary stenosis. Uh, moderate stenosis is defined as a peak gradient of 36 to 64 millimeters of mercury. Whereas severe stenosis is defined as a peak gradient of 64 millimeters of mercury. It is also indicated in symptomatic patients with moderate or severe pulmonary regurgitation. Moderate will be defined as a regurgitation fraction of 25 to 40% and a regurgitation jet width of less than 50% of the pulmonary wall annulus on echocardiography. And severe is defined as regurgitation fraction of more than 40%, the regurgitation jet width of more than 50% of pulmonary wall annulus at echocardiography. Or although these are class one recommendations for symptomatic uh, patients, for asymptomatic patients, uh, the guidelines are not that clear, clear cut. But uh, it is indicated in patients with moderate or severe pulmonary regurgitation. And even if asymptomatic, provided they meet at least two of the following criteria. Uh, these criteria are severe right ventricular dis uh, dilatation, progressive right ventricular dysfunction, increased right ventricular systolic pressure, LV dysfunction, exercise intolerance, atrial or ventricular tachyarrhythmias, prolonged QRS, and moderate or severe tricuspid insufficiency. What are the advantages of transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement? It, uh, most of these patients require uh, repeated uh, open surgical procedures during their lifetime. And uh, so this offers a, a, a less invasive alternative to the surgical, to surgical uh, pulmonary valve replacement. Uh, most of these patients can be extubated on the same day, and so early discharge is possible. And the cost is somewhat comparable to open surgery. Contraindications. Some of the contraindications are lack of venous access, which can be either femoral or jugular. Severe pulmonary stenosis that cannot be relieved by balloon dilatation. Active endocarditis, systemic infection, allergy to aspirin or heparin, and pregnancy. Uh, what are the types of walls which are used in transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement? These are basically balloon expandable walls or self expanding walls. The balloon expandable walls are the melody, which was the first wall which was uh, FDA approved and created. And the second is the harmony. Rest all walls are self expanding. Some of these are not. Uh, some of these are not approved by FDA. And uh, for uh, for further discussion, I'll only be talking about melody wall. 
the procedure of transcatheter pulmonary valve uh, replacement is done under general anesthesia uh, uh, with fluoroscopy guidance to assess the rvot anatomy and the pulmonary artery anatomy for vas vascular access either a femoral route is preferred but if not then the jugular and ideally on the right side is taken this video by metronic briefly describes the transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement following which i will describe the steps of mel melody valve placement With Melody TPV therapy, an artificial heart valve designed specifically for the pulmonic position is delivered by a catheter without requiring open chest surgery through the body's cardiovascular system. During the Melody TPV procedure, a flexible catheter, the ensemble delivery system, is inserted into the venous system, most often into the femoral vein through a small access site in the leg. The Melody TPV is loaded onto the catheter and the system is placed into the vein and guided to the desired location within the heart. Once the melody valve is at the desired location, the system's proprietary balloon-in-balloon -balloon technology is inflated. Inner balloon first, followed by the outer balloon, to fully expand the valve with controlled and accurate placement. Once the melody valve is expanded into place, it immediately begins to direct unobstructed blood flow from the right ventricle to the lungs preventing regurgitation. The delivery system is removed and tests are conducted to assess whether the valve is working appropriately. Uh, there are four basic steps of uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. The first step is uh, assessment of the coronary artery and iota testing. The second step is the right ventricular orthotract balloon dilatation and even pre-stenting in okay. case of melody wall. And the third step is stenting of the landing zone and the fourth is the wall deployment. So the first step is coronary artery testing. In this group of patients, the, the coronaries are very much ab ab abnormal and there can be anomalous origin of the coronaries. And hence, in the beginning, we do a coronary artery testing and even during every step during wall and balloon wall placement and balloon dilatation, the coronaries are all tested we hope it die to make sure cor coronary compression is an absolute uh, is a dreaded complication and if the coronaries are com being compressed the procedure needs to be abandoned so this video shows the right so shows the left coronary and this is the right coronary artery which was done bef bef uh, before the procedure this the for the following steps are of a patient which we had done in january 2024 she was a 27 year old female who presented with the free uh, free with severe pulmonary regurgitation following tetralogy of phylo correction and we successfully managed to implant a, uh, a melody wall into the uh, into her the second step is the right ventricular of uh, tract balloon dilatation for melody wall uh, we also do something called as pre stenting which i'll show you in the next step so so in this uh, we do a balloon dilatation in this as you can see that uh, we are also checking the coronaries at every step of the procedure to make sure that we are not compressing them the third step is stenting of the uh, landing zone uh, the melody wall comes in two sizes one is a 16 and 18 millimeter it is made of bovine uh, jugular peric uh, jugular material and it is prone to be it is quite fragile and to prevent the we cannot install the wall directly and to prevent the wall from crimping we uh, put a stent before the final wall is placed so in this procedure in this uh, video you can see the stent being placed over here This is the final placement of the stent. During this step, there is mass, uh, there is a free, uh, there is severe pulmonary regurgitation, which is to be expected following the procedure, but it gets resolved once the wall is in place. The final step is the place is wall deployment. 
so this is the wall which is being deployed over the stent And this is the final placement of the melody wall, which unobstructed flows to both the right and the left pulmonary arches. So these were the four steps of the uh, transcranial pulmonary wall replacement. Uh, moving on to anesthesia management, a pre-procedural -pre evaluation is done in all patients, which includes history, physical examination, chest X-ray, review of past surgical notes, ECG, ec echocardiography, CT MRI, uh, see, uh, cardiac MRI, and CT. The cardiac, CT, cardiac MRI, CT, and echo is important in this class of patients because to delineate the RVOT pathology, if there is presence of any pulmonary regurgitation, pulmonary stenosis, the status of the bioprosthetic wall, any associated cardiac region, and basically for any associated coronary anomalies and their relative positions which might get compressed during wall implantation. From the anesthesia point, uh, an anesthetist should know the underlying pathology. If there is any presence of myocardial dysfunction, uh, presence of any pre-existing arrhythmias and cardiac devices in situ, and other organ system dysfunction that could potentially complicate the perioperative management. Uh, we prefer a general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation in, uh, for the procedure. This is because the procedure usually takes long. It's usually a three to four hour procedure. And the patient, uh, it, it's a quite an uncomfortable position for the patient. The arms are above the head and the elbows are secured so that lat uh, later, uh, lateral fluoroscopy can be done. And the patient should avoid coughing and movement during the deployment of the wall. So uh, that for this reason, we prefer general anesthesia. For induction, a large bore uh, peripheral cannula is secured. Standard anesthesia monitoring with ECG pulse oximetry is uh, ETCO2 is uh, connected. Invasive monitoring uh, with arterial and CVP lines are required for hemodynamic monitoring. Because this is a redo procedure, all, all precautions for redo should be kept in place. These patients have external defibrillator pads attached. Two units of cross match blood is kept available inside the, theater, uh, inside the hybrid lab. And a full dose of heparin is drawn for possible urgent initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass and ready to be administered. Systemic heparinization is achieved with the heparin dose of 100 international units per kg to maintain a clotting ACT uh, of more than 300 seconds. For induction, a combination of opioids, muscle relaxants, inhalation, and intravenous agents can be used. There is no specific uh, uh, choice of anesthetic. And of inotropes, dobutamine, adri, mildenone are kept ready for right ventricular support and can be started empirically in some patients with low baseline cardiac output or to treat post-deployment hypotension in patients with known right ventricular dysfunction. In addition to this, a double lumen tube or bronchial blockers must be kept available inside the hybrid theater in case of hemoptosis, which can occur during uh, due to pulmonary artery rupture, which can occur with the guide wire. And a baseline uh, and transesophageal echocardiography can be used for hemodynamic assessment. What are the complications? Uh, some of the acute complications and the is the coronary artery compression, which is the most dreaded, aortic regurgitation, wall embolization, the uh, right ventricular outflow tract or conduit rupture, tricuspid wall injury, pulmonary artery branch occlusion, hemoptysis, and pulmonary edema. Delayed complication, the most common complication is infective endocarditis, second being uh, wall uh, stent rupture, wall degeneration, and aortopulmonary fistula. Thank you. Thank you, Karimia, for that uh, nice presentation. You have showed us how to plan the pulmonary valve actually without doing the surgical uh, um, procedure. Thank you so much. So, uh, now I will request uh, Dr. Ganapati to get the fifth talk going on. Dr. Ganapati, please. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. The fifth talk is. Uh... Percutaneous closure of uh, paravalve leaks and, um, uh, with uh, more and more valve replacements and uh, TAVIs and uh, surgical valve uh, repairs. Uh, there is a uh, more and more possibilities of uh, 
paravalar leaks uh, where a redo surgery is very very uh, risky any uh, redo cardiac surgery is a high risk procedure uh, in that way the percutaneous closure of uh, paravalar leak with that plugs or uh, and plugs uh, device is a very uh, welcome uh, uh, innovation happened in the world and uh, now i call upon uh, dr akshita uh, for talking on percutaneous closure of uh, pvl yeah can you share your screen akshita uh, good evening sir yes sir i'm just sharing my screen Uh, is the screen visible, sir? Yeah, visible. Okay, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, respected faculty, my colleagues. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak on this platform. So today, the topic that has been given to me is uh, pretty much like uh, troubleshooting the troubleshooting that we have been doing. Um, so this is a percutaneous closure of paravalvular leak. So uh, my disclosures are there is no conflict of interest and I do not have any disclosures for this talk. Uh, so I will be uh, just giving a little bit of background regarding the percutaneous uh, uh, closure and what is a paravalvular leak and what are the different techniques we'll be using. And I would want to explain this with a clinical case scenario that we have faced in the institute. So paravalvular leak or paraprosthetic leak is a complication with the implantation of generally a prosthetic heart valve, whether it might be surgical or even a, a transcatheter like a TAVI. So the blood uh, starts flowing through a channel that is between the structure of the implanted valve and the cardiac tissue uh, that is most likely due to the lack of appropriate sealing mechanisms. So paravalvular leak refers to this uh, blood flowing through that channel. It may be crescent, oval shaped or round shaped and the tracks can be parallel, perpendicular or even serpentinous. So it is more it is more common with mechanical valves with the mitral valve being the most common valve to be involved. Uh, so the etiology and mechanism of flow <laughs> um so the etiology uh, could include uh, uh, multiple factors including the local anatomy the inter uh, interventional technique the patient's own status as well as the center's expertise so uh, in infection uh, friability calcifications and the annular uh, anatomy could play a role in potential future paravalvular leaks as well as the type of suturing that has been used. Uh, patients who are having an advanced age or previous history of endocarditis uh, with uh, malnutrition status and previous valvular interventions are also at a risk for paraprosthetic uh, leaks. So uh, I'd want to continue with, uh, uh, with the patient profile that we had faced. This was a 45-year-old male patient who is a known hypothyroid and hypotensive. And he presented to us with post-operative day five of mitral valve replacement, mainly the main uh, clinical uh, picture being a very prolonged requirement for oxygenation and worsening respiratory distress and uh, a reveal of a uh, of a regurgitant jet in the mitral valve of uh, showing good valvular function, but there was an eccentric jet of four to five mm. So generally, when you have patients of paravalvular leak, they present with three uh, three main features. Uh, one is that they might be having hemolytic anemia, which would be seen by a decrease in hemoglobin an increase in the lactate dehydrogenase levels and also alterations in the retic count as well as increase in the bilirubin uh, and haptoglobin uh, in the uh, uh, serum. 
Another uh, presenting feature could be heart failure, depending upon the severity of the leak. Uh, that could be indirectly also detected by an increase in uh, uh, NT-pro BNP or the natriuretic peptide. Uh, so another unpublished finding is that uh, with a replacement or with a repair of a paravalvular leak, they have noted a certain amount of decrease in this BNP levels. Um, the third things are symptoms of uh, infective endocarditis, which could present with fever uh, that is um, refractory in nature uh, with the usual symptoms of infective endocarditis. So now when we are suspecting a patient with paravalvular leak, the next obvious step would be to arrive at a diagnosis. So echocardiography, both TTE as well as TEE play a very important role in terms of um, diagnosing the paravalvular leak. In terms of TT, uh, TTE, it has or uh, suffers a disadvantage because if we are not able to um, uh, very well differentiate if it is a valve degeneration versus a uh, uh, panis or a paravalvular leak per se. So because of that, the TEE has a distinct advantage, um, especially whenever you are finding difficulty with the presence of thrombi or pericardial fluid or acoustic shadows and artifacts coming in the way. When we are trying to diagnose paravalvular leaks, the following information we need to be looking at. The shape and orientation of the jet, the number of jets that are there, what is the maximum velocity with which the jet is uh, flowing, and the presence of any distal flow reversals as, as well as pulmonary pressures, especially, uh, especially when we're assessing mitral paravalvular leaks. Um, so this was the TEE image that we got initially when we were evaluating this patient. There are also other indirect ma uh, markers of paravalvular leaks in case of any confusion. So in case of a mitral paravalvular leak, we will see that there is a a uh, decrease in the uh, in the maximum velocity in the diastolic period uh, and um, there is also an increased mean gradient across the valve uh, more than 5 mm hd uh, there might be an increase in the vti across the valve with the lvot vti uh, uh, the ratio of the mitral valve vti to lvot vti that will be more than 2.5 and there might be a tricuspid regurgitation with a maximum velocity more than 3 meters per second when we are suspecting aortic paravalvular leaks we will see that there will be a shortening of the pressure half time there might be a flow reversal in the distal thoracic aorta the regurgitant fraction will be more than 50 percent and there will be a lack of a uh, left ventricular end diastolic volume uh, despite a uh, adequately functioning uh, um, valve uh, this is another view uh, in the tee clearly showing the regurgitant jet from the mitral valve um, so we can also uh, use the TEE to get like a semi-quantitative assessment of uh, the mitral or any paravalvular leak per se, because the circumferential length to the entire valve length is what we will define as a mild, where it is less than 10%, a moderate is 10 to 20% leak, uh, severe is more than 20%, and valve instability is defined as more than 40% ratio to the circumference. Additional tools that help in uh, 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 in uh, assessing paravalvular leaks is 3D reconstruction or uh, intracardiac echocardiography or a multi slice CT as well. So now when we have diagnosed a patient with a paravalvular leak, the next thing that we need to look for is uh, based on symptomology whether we want to further go ahead for treatment. Now, there might be a situation where you're confused whether surgery would be the option compared to a percutaneous evaluation. So there are some uh, there are some indications where surgery is the absolute must and we should not consider percutaneous at all. And that would be when there is a significant uh, dysfunction and valvular instability of the prosthetic valve, there, uh, even infective endocarditis. And maybe if you also require an, uh, a CABG along with the um, paravalvular leak closure. So a percutaneous one, uh, 
there are three ways that we access. Uh, this is the patient that required a mitral valve. So this access is generally through the femoral vein that uh, happens with a transeptal puncture. This is generally the access that we use whenever there is a mitral valve, uh, paravalvular leak. Um, the other access point is by femoral artery, which is a retrograde manner. And that we use generally for aortic paravalvular leaks. And when it comes to the third mode of access, it could be in a hybrid setup where we are uh, utilizing the transapical, that is the apex, through the thoracotomy or a, even a percutaneous access. So here we can see that they had already put in. Um, so this is more of an innovative type where we have a, a combination of fluoroscopy with TEE guidance for the paravalvular leak uh, and uh, placement of the uh, device around it. Um, here we are seeing that they were uh, trying to guide the catheter through after already performing the septal puncture. So in terms of... In terms of uh, after establishing access, all three or all mechanisms have the same step where they pass the catheter that is more uh, to the proximity of the paravalvular canal. They then go through with a guide wire that is passed across it and to guide and advance the device inside. And finally, with the utilization of TEE, they are able to further ensure the placement of device and deploy it. So here we can see that the device is being deployed and placed. This was the TE image of uh, passing the guide wire and guiding it through as well. So the different devices that are generally utilized, uh, the Ampla, the uh, vascular plug 3 is a device that is most commonly used. But we also can utilize a regular VSD device depending upon the size of the leak as well. So after we had deployed the device, we can see that there is an improvement and there is no persistent le uh, paravalvular leak after it. So some of the complications that can occur with uh, some of the complications that can occur whenever we are uh, using devices are that it can result in a cardiac tamponade. The device itself can migrate and embolize, and it can further worsen the dysfunction of the prosthetic valve because you might have a difficulty or cause an occlusion of the valve itself. You can cause a thrombus, and also um, it, it can become a potential site in the future for an infective endocarditis. However, we have to remember that echocardiography is one of the main uh, things that, uh, that are being utilized here. And it is uh, utilized both in a pre-intervention through the guiding and also in the post-intervention place. Pre-intervention because we want to do the cardiac assessment, to want to do the research for the infective endocarditis, uh, the severity of the regurgitation and the suitability of the uh, paravalvular uh, leak devices. Um, the during the procedure for septal puncture, uh, for posi uh, positioning the occluder for the normal function of the prosthetic valve as well, immediately to look for results and also to see if there is any residual leaks. Also assess for any complications that are immediate and life threatening, such as a tamponade. Post intervention, we would want to see whether the position is still intact. If it is not migrating, what is the further functioning of the prosthetic valve, and whether if there is any relapse of the regurgitation, and if there are any long-term complications like infective endocarditis. So, in terms of the anesthetic management, per se, there is no guideline in terms of which would be the best mode of anesthesia that would be utilized for this. Um, while uh, while some textbooks argue that general anesthesia would be the way to go, uh, in 2023, the Journal of Clinical Medicine, uh, they had an expert panel on uh, this. Uh, some, while some uh, argued that general anesthesia would be the best way to go, especially when it uh, comes for uh, mitral um, uh, mitral leaks uh, versus aortic valves can be under uh, local anesthesia. But um, uh, per se, there was no consensus regarding this. So, thank you. I uh, I'm open to questions. Yeah, that was a, a nice comprehensive uh, uh, presentation, um, uh, Akshita. Uh, 
we can go on to the uh, we'll take the questions later yes sir we'll go on to the next uh, uh, speaker yes sir thank you sir <clears throat> thank you sir thank you ganapati sir thank you akshita that was a nice uh, presentation uh, to wind up our uh, last speaker of the day uh, we have dr shah prishikesh milind and he would be talking about the closure of uh, la appendage dr prishikesh could you start your uh, sharing the slide Dr. Hrishikesh, you're not audible. Hrishikesh, are you speaking? Not audible, sir. Yes, sir. Some issue is there. I will sort it out, sir. Uh, am I audible, sir, now? Yeah, you are audible. Yes, sir. There are yes, the, sir. different types of uh, left atrial appendage. You can, you can start from the first slide. Okay, okay. So today, we will be discussing what is LA appendage closure, imaging challenges in LA appendage closure. Type, types of LA appendage closure devices and anesthetic management. Uh, different types of LA left atrial appendage are chicken wing shape, short neck chicken wing, wing sock, cactus, cauliflower, large double lobe LA appendage. Uh, left atrial appendage is a significant source of L, uh, left atrial thrombi, mostly in patients having chronic AF, non valvular AF. Uh, it, uh, it is generally treated with. Uh, 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 to prevent the risk of stroke, it is generally treated with anticoagulants. Uh, but other alternative is mechanical left atrial occlusion. It has been used instead of, to, as an alternative to oral anticoagulation. Because in oral anticoagulation, there is increased bleeding risk. Uh, this is the TE image of uh, left atrial appendage. Uh, and this is the pericardial space where most uh, where device, uh, LA occluding device is kept. Uh, there are two most commonly used uh, LA appendage device occluders. One is endocardial left atrial appendage occluder. Most common is Watchman occluder and implant. And uh, is, uh, other example is implants. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it is used for LA osteal diameter of 14 to 31.5 mm. And uh, it has around uh, 10 coils. Uh, and it. <clears throat> Next is epicardial left at atrial appendage occlusion. It is lariat suture delivery device. It is uh, it can be used as endocardial as well as uh, by combined approach endocardial as well as epicardial. Uh, <clears throat> advantage of is that there is no uh, after uh, occluding there is no portion of, is left in left atrial appendage of the occluding device. Uh, what are the indications of LA appendage closure? Are patients with AF who are at increased risk of stroke based on chart 2 vas score uh, for chart for chart 2 vas score more than 2 in males or more than 3 in females oral anticoagulation or mechanical occlusion uh, is recommended uh, chart 2 vas score uh, it includes following parallel like uh, congestive heart failure lv dysfunction hypertension age more than 75 diabetes mellitus stroke vascular uh, disease age 65 to 74 a female cat, a sex category, female, if it is there, it is one point. Maximum score is nine. Contraindications of LA appendage closure, uh, if there is cardiac thrombus, if there is there might be increased risk of dislodgement and embolization. 
then inoperate anatomy of selected device sensitivity to any components of the device inability to tolerate post procedure anti thrombotic therapy and prior surgical repair uh, or there is a presence of interatrial septal device there is my a recent myocardial infarction within the prior 3 months or an embolic event in the within prior 30 days this is a watchman uh, flex second generation watchman device this is a endocardial left atrial appendage occluder this is inserted endocardially to occlude the left atrial appendage uh, what are the advantages of left atrial appendage uh, it is an alternative to oral anticoagulation it reduces the risk of stroke then uh, then uh, those in with bleeding risk is more it uh, it uh, is it uh, used as an alternative it reduces the bleeding risk uh then uh, it can be it is a minimally invasive procedure complications of la appendage closure are device embolization bleeding chest pain arrhythmia infection pericardial effusion now we will come to perioperative management uh, during before assessing the patient pre procedural uh, assessment is done to determine the size of la appendage la anatomy the uh, ostium diameter uh, to uh, predict the size uh, device size uh, to be used for uh, occluding la appendage and also to rule out pre existing thrombus because in uh, intracardiac thrombus is a contraindication it can be done use uh, imaging it can be done using ct angiography or te <coughs> uh, anesthesia management uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, in, it depends on institutional factors it may vary from place to place some in some places it is done under mac or in some places it is done under ga but uh, ga is used when we have to uh, use te probe for it uh, large peri large bore peripheral access should be obtained to allow for fluid resuscitation as needed pack pack red blood cells should be available prior to start of procedure uh, anesthetic management uh, in uh, most important is fluid loading inter procedural volume volume loading prior to echocardiographic assessment of la append anatomy and size should be considered because uh, echocardiography showed an average increase in la orifice diameter of 1.9 mm and la depth of 2.5 mm after giving around 500 to 1000 ml bolus it allows proper device sizing and reduces para device leak but also while uh, volume loading should also take into the consideration if uh, uh, should not exacerbate pulmonary edema and heart failure with reduced lv function uh, then uh, intra procedural te examination is done to rule out intracardiac thrombus if there is any complication like effusion to evaluate interatrial septum for uh, b b septal puncture and to confirm the appropriate device size <coughs> uh, these are the uh, this is la appendage uh, uh, this is a this is a step where it, uh, it is placed uh, device is placed la uh, appendage is ligated and occluded this is the pro procedure done in this uh, device is being inserted and then it will it is released inside to occlude la uh, after while when device is placed uh, for uh, after, for releasing uh, following criteria is pass and close criteria Uh, for watchman device pass criteria is used uh, it uh, it determine it is based on the position of the device uh, it device should is should be at the ostium of left, left atrial appendage then it uh, a is for anchor the, it should be properly anchored to the left atrial appendage and device size should be compressed 8 to 20% and uh, <clears throat> that uh, it should form also form a proper seal Uh, if uh, seal is if seal is not proper vena contractor uh, should be less than 5 mm and close is uh, for implants uh, implants uh, device uh, c is for two third of device lobe is distal to circumflex artery l is device lobe compressed o is for orientation of device coaxial to left atrial appendage s is separation of disc and lobe and e is disc will have concave elliptical shape now post operative care uh, te uh, imaging should be done for uh, watchman and amplus device at after 45 days to reassess device position stability and seal the device left at atrium and la appendix are evaluated for device related thrombus and interatrial septum is imaged for assessment of residual asd 
timing for follow up imaging for the lariat procedure which is a epicardial device occluder is variable but may be performed 30 days post procedure and then annually for 3 years it is common for watchman patient a watchman device patient to receive warfarin and aspirin therapy until 45 days post procedure if no device related thrombus or residual leak more than 5 mm is seen on follow up t warfarin is replaced with dual antiplatelet therapy for 6 months after 6 months aspirin is continued indefinitely thank you thank you thank you for the presentation shikesh and i request all the uh, dr ganapati dr kaushik anuradha to unmute their mics and switch on their videos and uh, look in the chat box and answer those questions please unshare your screen shikesh yes sir dr ganapati kaushik anuradha to switch on the videos and mute yourself yeah yes sir yes sir and uh, in the chat box there are uh, two questions i think right uh, dr sonakshi malaka uh, asked like should uh, cerebral protection device be regarded as must for tavi and should uh, uh, to answer this question is uh, not for all patients not as a must uh it is done in very very high risk patients where there is uh, the calcium score is very high and uh, uh and the risk of uh, uh calcific emboli can happen there we use that uh, cerebral protection device yeah it is uh, pretty much available nowadays uh, and uh, easy to use Um, yeah so that uh, ivc filters actually the in the carotid so the calcium so that same ivc filter we put it in the carotid so it helps in the cerebral protection which we use here in narayana okay okay okay, okay. Uh, we use the the proper one I, okay sir yeah uh the inst- the another question is uh, from uh, rupsa and uh, institutional protocols in delivering anesthesia services for structural heart procedures would have been appreciable to share your experience with the audience um, i felt less anesthesia more cardiology in these uh, presentations uh yes we wanted like that because uh, uh whoever is in uh, general anesthesia population uh, a lot of people may not know about these procedures that's why we wanted like this and uh, institutional regarding institutional protocols uh, i have few comments on this uh, pre- presentations uh, uh like uh, uh, initially the tavi uh, we were talking about tavi and uh, there are uh, high risk low risk and intermediate risk generally when we started tavi this procedures were <laughs> for high risk patients uh, then slowly after uh, the improvement in technology nowadays they are uh, uh, coming to intermediate risk low risk so that sts scoring system what we routinely follow for uh, cardiac surgeries so less than 4 is uh, low risk 4 to 8 is intermediate risk and more than uh it is high risk um and uh, next to nowadays uh, because of the technological ad- advancements the approach for tavi is 99% uh, only transfemoral and the second in common is transcarotid uh, we don't do uh, transapical approach anymore and uh, another point uh, regarding that uh, speaker with the mitra clip uh uh she put like a mitra clip uh in a mitral ring patient is difficult but actually mitral ring uh and less than 4 cm squared or spx especially if the uh mitral valve area is less than 3.5 cm squared it is absolutely uh, not possible to put a uh mitra clip because it almost halves the uh, mitral valve area and uh, and the mitral ring 
if it is there generally we, they don't go for uh, 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 mitra clip they will go for uh, uh, tmvr uh, valve in uh, ring uh, uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement and uh, uh, so that is the one thing and uh, regarding tmvr uh, we have uh, the speaker has talked a lot about uh, native tmvr but uh, uh, i don't know if kaushik can correct me wrong uh, or something uh, murli sir uh, we have uh, not doing any uh, very very rarely native valve tm we are doing we are mostly doing and the more common procedure is valve in valve because native valve tmvrs uh, the success rate is only 60% and it is indicated uh, just if it is nothing is available more than 90 95 years and you need adequate calcium to hold and the biggest problem is lvot obstruction because uh, uh, we know as cardiac anesthetists we always uh, the surgeons cut the aml uh, before uh, uh, placing the valve so uh, so the biggest problem is lvot obstruction embolization and uh, uh, malpositions because of all these things so the more commonly performed i uh, i'm not aware that any uh, native valve tmvr is done in india and uh, so more common is valve in valve and uh, i think that is the only yeah. uh, approved fda approved indication is valve in valve performance okay okay and uh, regarding uh, the speaker has told like uh, tmvr uh, is more favorable for uh, uh, functional uh, something like that uh, actually it's not like that uh, mitra clip is done both for degenerative the prolapse thing and functional thing and the tmvr also can be done for uh, either the cause but depending upon the anatomy uh and uh, thing uh, generally tmvr is done in a uh, prosthetic valve uh, a dysfunction uh, with the stenosis or something like that and uh, mitra clip is done for for um, f- done for mitral regurgitation mainly so the minimum requirement uh, of mitral valve area is 3.5 cm squared 3.5 to 4 is a borderline thing and uh, coming to tricuspid uh, the uh, speaker has talked a lot of uh, the new tricuspid uh, devices and uh, uh, of uh, the uh, of the thing only the triclip is uh, commonly used nowadays and the triclip is also nothing but so mitra clip put in the tricuspid area and uh, the other devices are in development or uh, not performed clinically they are in research stages only mostly except this trike trick valve trick valve is uh, uh, we started using it it is uh, it is just uh, physiologically we are placing two valves in uh, svc and ivc and stent and uh, that we have done but the rest of the tricuspid uh, uh, devices are in a development stage only and they are used in patients for research purposes not clinically uh, i think uh, coming to the question uh, general anesthesia versus uh, conscious sedation uh, each institution has their own protocols when uh, except tavi most other procedures what we have discussed we go for general anesthesia and we don't need to worry like general anesthesia is risky in this procedures uh, i will personally say it is even safer because a uh, cardiologist always take conscious sedation is better 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 but uh, uh, general anesthesia for a open cardiac surgery or a general anesthesia for a upper abdominal surgery or thoracic surgery is different from general anesthesia for a procedure here we don't have any pain here we don't have any uh, collapse basal collapse here we don't have any problem of patient coughing post operative so almost same uh so as a cardiac anesthetist we know how to monitor those patients we know how to uh, do invasive monitoring everything so if we feel t is needed for the procedure we better give etga and only for tavi uh, because it is mostly uh, pleuroscopy guided than transesophageal echocardiography guided we can manage with transthoracic echocardiography so there we do lot of uh, conscious sedations uh, nowadays uh, for that also i in uh, my institution and most of the institution i heard of uh, high volume centers they put invasive pressures 
they put a uh, arterial line and a big bore vent flon i personally put central line for all these patients and when i put central line i always put a, a six french sheath also for um, uh, tpa intro introduction or and the one advantage of uh, keeping tpa in the right IJV is you can keep it uh, even for a next day so that the patient can be ambulated irrespective of the fact the patient has gone into block or something and we are using it. So that is the advantage. So we stopped using uh, femoral uh, TPIs and started routinely using uh, right IJV uh, uh, TPIs, uh, the balloon tipped one, uh, the speaker has told correctly. So only thing is we keep the balloon inflated so that it doesn't cause any puncture or uh, tamponade or anything. We had uh, one uh, like and uh, uh, um, so the monitoring is same. Monitoring is same and the preoperative workup, everything is like a cardiac surgery because any of these TAVIs still we do with the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass pump standby with the surgeon standby and uh, the whole OT backup team standby. So in that way, invasive pressure monitoring is must. And so whether it is conscious sedation or general anesthesia, we keep the monitoring as same. Conscious sedation, it is personal choice. People can use ventral metazolum, uh, dexmedetomidin, propofol, mild propofol infusions, everything. Personally, I, I don't like the concept of only local anesthesia for TAVI because we will be doing most of the times rapid atrial pacing. It is, we are stopping the heart of the patient and it is impending doom of death. The patient will feel like that. So some form of sedation, uh, mild sedation should be there. Under local anesthesia, it is to be avoided because invariably, if you do uh, rapid atrial pacing in awake patient, patient, Pressure will come to 30, 40. You can understand what it will be. His brain status will be. Patient will start moving. So that is not at all uh, uh, recommended. Patient should be adequately sedated at this point of rapid atrial pacing. And it is the duty of anesthetist. We should not make sure we should make sure the patient is not moving at that time. So that is uh, one thing I will uh, suggest for the uh, only local anesthesia. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Ganapati, all it. your uh, thank you for your input. Do you have anything else to say? You sorry, Dr. Kaushik, you want to comment? Uh, Dr. Kaushik, what are you? What's your take on the presentations and any comments or any you'd like to say? Sir, uh, very nice uh, presentations. Uh, uh, as uh, one of the participants just pointed out, there was very less of anesthesia and. Uh, Lots of cardiology, and I think that is the entire uh, uh, focus of an anesthetist nowadays. Uh, they call it the minimalistic approach, especially for Tavis and uh, Ganapati sir has spoken uh, volumes about it uh, just now. So as far as an anesthetist is uh, concerned, uh, you optimize the monitoring and uh, minimize the anesthetic uh, exposure for Tavis as as much as possible. That's, that's the... Uh, philosophy for TAVIs and, and the remaining sessions were really nice. Most of the uh, techniques and all the other procedures also have been covered in depth. It leaves very little for me to add on. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Anuradha, you want to say anything? No, no, sir. Sir has covered everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, all the points were brought out by Bal um, Ganapati and uh, Kaushik yeah. are valid. Thank you so much. Uh, the point of the seminar was to bring out the technic technical details of the procedures because not <laughs> only we are giving anesthesia, we are also monitoring and uh, most importantly, we are doing the echocardiography, TE echocardiography is being done. So we should know how it is being done. That is the basic uh, fundamental requirement of anybody who is taking care of these patients. So it is very vital for us to know the procedural details and it's also good to know what how it is being done so that you can adjust your uh, technology or anesthetic technique to the requirements of the particular situation for example if uh, rapid ventricular pacing is needed when the deployment of the valve is taken you have to know that they are doing that so all these uh, technical details are very very uh, important for us to know 
um, and uh, uh, to say that only techniques have been this is not correct because the basic management depends upon how much we know about what is being done. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, one, uh, one thing, sir, uh, there is one more question. I missed it. Yeah. Is the left ventricular uh, uh, function altered post TMBR from uh, Sonakshi Malaka? Uh, so, this it question is, it is like, answered uh, by. Elizabeth followed by Ganapati and Kaushik, maybe. Elizabeth, do you want to say anything about this? Sir, I'm not very sure about the answer, sir. Okay, Dr. Ganapati and Kaushik. Yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Uh, obviously, uh, when you correct MR, there is an afterload mismatch for the left ventricular function. So, LV will struggle. Uh, like that is like uh, from MBR, so we have to support with some inotropes. But having said that, it is very very easier to manage after a mitral clip or a TMBR because we are not uh, having a problem of myocardial preservation for a cardiopulmonary bypass pump. So we may run a little bit of adrenaline or uh, dobutamine to support the left ventricular function. But there is no myocardial preservation issue of a cardiopulmonary pump run here right, and the right, RV dysfunction right. won't be there. So it is easier to manage a patient with post-TMVR or post-mitra clip than surgical MVR. And uh, invariably, 99 out of 100 times, I extubate the patient on table, whether it is a mitra clip or TMVR. Even right. though they are having bad uh, left ventricular function, we will be able to extubate on table or at the max hmm. half an hour into or one hour into uh, CTAC or ca uh, cardiac CC. Yeah, I agree with that uh, reply. Kaushik, do you want to say anything on this issue? I think, sir, I think adequately explained. Uh, since it's being done without the use of cardiopulmonary bypass, hmm. it makes the uh, the catecholamine exposure post surgery very lesser. So right. most of the times uh, they have a much lesser stomach course in the ICU compared to the other right. surgical techniques. Yes. Okay. Right, right. Thank you, thank you for that. I think we need to close the session because we just exceeded the time limit of nine p.m. I would like to thank Ganapati, Kaushik, and Anuradha for being with us, and uh, the all the speakers, Saujanya, Elizabeth, Satish, Karishma. Ramani and Rishikesh have done well. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the Indian College of Anesthesiology, I'd like to thank the leadership for this opportunity and um, all the participants for uh, your participation. And we'll meet you next Wednesday for another topic. Until then, goodbye. Thank, thank you, you so you. much, thank Clarinet, you. for thank being you. with thank us. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Dr. Jay Shri, you want to say anything? Yeah, yes. Because yeah, please, please say, please say. Yeah. I wanted to thank all the uh, the moderators and the speakers for the excellent webinar. It was such a, a topic that could <laughs> only be covered by them and no one else. And it was very, very in, uh, interesting. And of course, the speakers were very good. And also the moderation done was excellent. We learned a lot. Thank you so much for uh, joining this webinar and contributing to the ICA webinars. We are almost going to complete 200. So that will be a big event. Thank you very yes, much. Thank yes. you, Dr. Kanji. I think, I think before you leave, I want to say that tomorrow is World Women's Day. I would like to congratulate all the women. Yes. And uh, <laughs> you are one of the leaders. Nine, nine. You are the you top so most uh, lady leader in the world. One of the nine, one of the top top nine, most nine, lady nine. leaders. I would nine, like two, to uh, thank all the ladies present yes, here. Yes, yes, yes. Tomorrow we'll be celebrating. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank okay. You. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, dear doctors, for sharing such valuable insights. Thank, thank I hope you had a seamless experience. And yes. uh, looking forward to host you again very soon in another interactive session. Till then, stay safe and healthy. And once again, we wish you all a happy Women's, Women's Day in advance to all the yes, stalwarts yes. present over here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank with all your permission, you. we are signing off for today. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank Till you. Then, Ruksa. Goodbye and take care. Thank you. Ruksa. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Good night to all.